To change the world for the better, we must change how we do business, starting with where and how we invest our money. That's the rallying cry of my guest today, Sir Ronald Cohen. Sir Ronald or Ronnie, as he prefers to be known from time to time, took the lessons he had learned from being one of the UK's most successful investors and has spent the last 20 years relentlessly driving the development of what is now known as impact investments. He is the chairman of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment and the Portland Trust and has recently brought out his second book called Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change. So Ronald Cohn, Ronnie, a warm welcome to the Positive Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much. Great pleasure to be here with you, Jean-Philippe. You know, Ronnie, you've had the most incredible journey from a refugee to a super successful venture capitalist to impact investing pioneer. What really stands out for me is your lifelong interest in helping others. It's something I'd like to explore in this conversation together. But first, I'd like to go right back to the beginning. You were born in 1945 in Cairo, in Egypt, to a Jewish family. Yep. So what do you remember about yep. your time in Egypt, if you do, and what, what has shaped you from that time in your life? What, what I remember was a society where Muslims, Christians, and Jews got on extremely well. Religion was not an issue. When I asked my dad, I must have been seven or eight years old, what is religion about? He said to me, religions are just the different sides of a pyramid leading to the same God. <laughs> and, and that's what I left um, Egypt feeling about my childhood. Now, obviously, we lost everything. We had to leave precipitously with yeah. a suitcase each and 10 Egyptian pounds. So it was a very traumatic experience for my, mm. for my parents. But this feeling that we can all get on and that at the end of the day we're all seeking to lead normal lives is what has motivated me to get so involved in trying to help resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, Jean-Philippe. Hmm. And so you just talked about the, the tragic events of the time, I think it was uh, in 1957, right, when uh, President Gamal Abdel right. Nasser drive at Egypt's Jewish population the aftermath of the Suez crisis. This is when I think you had to go. And right. actually, it reminds me of my own family history in different, uh, in different contexts, Ronnie. My parents, my two sisters, my grandma, myself had to leave Algeria when, when the country became independent in 1962. So when I, was, when I was 18 months old, I was younger than yourself, but it was a complete reset for my family. So I can fully relate to what you mean, coming back to, well, to France, in the case you could see it was the same country, but it looked like almost like a different country for us. <laughs> and we had to start again from, right. from scratch with a couple of bits of luggage, and, but the incredible fighting spirit. And I think this is what you did. So how did you react you know, as a person, as a child, to this dramatic change in your circumstances? You know, in my previous podcast at Bill George, uh, we would call that a crucible moment. So what was that a crucible moment for you, Ronnie? <laughs> and what did you learn from it? Okay. Hey. Yeah. So uh, interesting that we should uh, share uh, similar backgrounds as uh, refugees, uh, <laughs> uh, Jean-Philippe. In the case of my parents, who were in their mid-40s, uh, they presented everything as a challenge to me. So. The biggest impression that was made on me at the time of, uh, of my arrival in the UK is when my dad took me to visit the headmaster of a state school um, and uh, he had to gain admittance for me. And he said to the headmaster, look, it's not because he's my kid, uh, but if you take him, he'll be top of the class. <laughs> now, you can imagine for an 11-year-old shifting country in rented accommodation in a small apartment trying to get into a school the sense of responsibility that, yes, <laughs> that it huge. gave me to yes. perform and and small things like uh, my mother baking a chocolate cake the minute <laughs> we arrived in our small apartment <laughs> to make life yeah. seem completely normal those things 
led me to have a very positive attitude about the challenge of learning English. I didn't speak English at the time, adjusting to life in, in Britain. And in retrospect, I was extremely lucky in my life to be welcomed um, by the UK and to build my, mm. my life there. So you, you really took every opportunity, uh, or every challenge, I would say, Ronnie, as an opportunity to grow and learn and do more uh, for developing yourself, but also supporting, I guess, your family, parents, and others uh, in this new context for the anti-family, which, which I think is... is so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was aware from about the age of 16 onwards that I would have to look after my parents. Hmm. Uh, that I would have to sustain them financially in their you know, later years. And, and so I, I knew that I had to be financially uh, successful to be, able, yeah. to be able to do that. Um, and I suppose as um, time went on and I went to Oxford, which I did thanks to an unbelievable teacher that I found in this... Uh, state school, Richard Farley, to whom mm. I owe a huge amount, and whom incidentally I tracked down 40 years after leaving Orange Hill uh, Grammar School and, 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 and spent a few years um, chatting um, with him. Going to Oxford mm. was a huge thing for me. You can imagine coming as a refugee oh, yeah. um, Seven, seven years earlier, and then all of a sudden I'm in this uh, 14th century <laughs> quadrangle at Exeter College with the huge privilege of having tutorials with famous professors and, you know, mm. and so on and so forth. And Oxford in the 60s was a very idealistic time, not unlike the period that millennials represent yeah. today. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, the period of... Uh, Uh, anti-nuclear um, mm. uh, armaments. Uh, this was uh, flower power. Um, mm. and, and so the combination of these values and the necessity for me um, to become financially independent um, to support my, my parents eventually led me mm. to this notion of doing good and doing well, <laughs> which... Uh, I tried to do through venture capital. We'll come back to that, Ronnie. That's wonderful to hear about the, the way, again, that crucible moment uh, started to, to define who you are and, uh, you, and what you're going to achieve in your life. And, you know, one of the things that I think is important for a positive leader to be able to do, and I was, I was talking about this on the podcast with a, a guest called Mo Godat, uh, who is the best-selling author of Soul for Happy, is to be able to define your ambition when managing your own expectations in life. So it's both ambitious, being ambitious, but having clear expectations for your life. And to be bold in that ambition, I think you are very bold in your ambitions very actually fairly early on. Back in 1972, you just briefly talk about that, I think when you were 26 years old, you decided to create one of the very first venture funds in the UK, Apex Partner. Partners, uh, and um, Apex went on to become one of Europe's and global leading private equity firms, providing seed funding to companies including Apple, Waterstones, Virgin, AOL, and many more. I think. So, what was your ambition, your bold goal at the time, Ronnie, <laughs> when you set up Apex, and why were you so certain that creating this new form of finance could work? I, I felt that the sky was the limit, Jean-Philippe. <laughs> I was lucky when I was at Oxford to be elected president of the Oxford Union, which is the debating mm. society, yeah. which has been uh, uh, you know, a sort of school for prime ministers in yeah. the UK. And when I was president of the union, I invited very prominent people to come and speak during my term of, of office. Uh, so there are three presidents of the union a year. You get elected based on your debating powers. And I invited Bobby Kennedy, and Bobby Kennedy came. And Bobby wow. Kennedy asked me to invite all the great thinkers, he gave me a list, of, uh, of, of the time, <laughs> who were at Oxford. 
people like uh, Sir Isaiah Berlin and uh, Sir Kenneth Weir and Sir <laughs> Maurice Barrow. And, and so I found myself uh, at the age of 22 sitting with Bobby Kennedy and, and all of these luminaries wow. <laughs> discussing what uh, the US should do in Vietnam. And I, I well remember saying to Bobby Kennedy in answer to the question, what would you do? I said, I would withdraw from Vietnam. <laughs> and he, he said, uh, but look at the consequences if we withdraw. I said, but the end is going to be that you withdraw, so better to do it sooner rather than later. Now, I give this anecdote <laughs> because I had by then begun to get confidence in my judgment. For sure. <laughs> and so when and, and so I was brought up to be very ambitious and I wanted to build something of real significance and I felt again that you know I could I could achieve anything that I set my mind to now I think this is what characterizes entrepreneurs <laughs> uh, ventures grow to the size of their entrepreneur's vision. An entrepreneur yeah. with a small vision will build a small company. You very seldom find an entrepreneur starting out with a small vision and ending up with a massive company. It That's tends right. to be that if you think big, you achieve big. And in my first book, The Second Bounce of, of, of the Ball, mm -hmm. I deal with this, this question of, of climbing the north face and getting <laughs> to the top, picking a really big challenge yeah. and achieving it. Now, Part of it is my background at home. Mm -hmm. um, a Jewish mother is a great <laughs> incentive in life because you wake <laughs> up every morning being told you're the best and the most handsome and the, and the cleverest <laughs> and, and you should go for it. Um, <laughs> but a lot of it had to do with uh, my, my time at uh, Oxford, hmm. actually. And then when I, I was about to graduate with my degree in philosophy, politics and economics, after my term as president mm -hmm. of the union, just ahead of my final exam, I went home and asked my dad, I said, what am I going to do now with a degree in PPE? Mm -hmm. uh, he said to me, why don't you go to Harvard Business School? I'd never <laughs> discussed Harvard Business School with him before, Jean-Philippe. Uh -huh. And he, in, he gave me the opportunity <laughs> um, to think about something that turned out to be just the right step for me. And I was mm. lucky to get a scholarship, <laughs> and I went to HBS. I discovered venture yep. capital there, and yep. you know the rest followed. So a lot of, uh, more than encouragement, a lot of uh, exciting challenges and aspiration driven by your parents, uh, Ronnie, in your, in your childhood, and uh, of course, as you grew up as well. Um, We'll come back, obviously, to your vision of finance and evolving vision of finance you have. We talk a lot about uh, being purpose-led in the podcast and in terms of what you want to do with your life. And I mean with your life, your entire life, right? Both your personal and your professional life together. And the way you want to connect that with whatever you get to do in your uh, early 60s, you started bringing your purpose to life in a new way when you decided to dedicate your time to transforming finance into an engine for positive impact. So what led you to make that mental shift <laughs> to move beyond the fundamentals right. of risk and return venture capital to embrace impact investment, investment made with intention to generate measurable social environmental impact alongside a financial return? Tell us what has been the trigger and, and why. <laughs> so. Uh, so in retrospect, the dots connect uh, in all our lives, <laughs> Jean-Philippe. Yeah. Uh, but looking ahead, uh, they don't connect as, um, as, as obviously uh, as uh, reality uh, eventually um, shows them to do. So I decided at the age of 53 hmm. that I would leave Apex at 60 and that every partner after me at Apex would leave at the same age, I would leave my shares to my partners and the aim would be to build a powerful legacy yep. institution. Today, Apex has gone through two uh, leadership transitions and manages $75 billion in private equity. So 
uh, I had the ambition to leave a firm hmm. that continues to thrive. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. this year is the 50th anniversary of my <laughs> of my setting out, and we're we're celebrating it. So. I knew that I didn't want my epitaph to read, he delivered a 30% rate of return, <laughs> right? It didn't seem like the meaning of my life. Yeah. And I was very focused on social issues. I'd gone into venture capital because I thought it was a way of doing good and doing well. It was a way of making money, certainly, but it was a way of creating jobs yep. uh, as well uh, and improving uh, the opportunities that uh, people from very simple backgrounds would, uh, would, would have to acquire wealth. But as time went on, I realized that I was actually helping to increase the gap between rich and poor. Hmm. And so I decided to leave Apex to devote my life to two issues, hmm. the Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolution, yep. which we touched on, and social issues. And mm. then luck came into it. Because while I was in that process, in 2000, so when I was 55, I got a phone call from the British Treasury hmm. saying, will you look with a more entrepreneurial eye at how we deal with the issue of poverty? However much money we seem to throw at it, Mm. We don't seem to make a big dent in it. And that gave me the opportunity to delve deeply <laughs> into the reasons why uh, we hadn't dealt with poverty more effectively. And because of my background in venture capital, I realized that we had not given <laughs> investment to those who want to improve lives. <laughs> And in 2000, uh, the Social Investment Task Force, which I led, published a report saying yep. basically we need to innovate in ways of bringing investment to those who want to improve lives, people in the social sector, yep. Yep. Uh, more than, than the world of business. Now, that effort then, through a number of milestones, led mm -hmm. to the discovery 10 years later at Social Finance, which I founded in, uh, co-founded in 2007, of the first social impact bond. Yeah, can, can you tell and us... social... Sorry, Ronnie, uh, can you tell us more about that concept? Because uh, uh, I recall, of course, reading your, your book that you decided to, to really focus on a very specific issue in the UK, the re offending rate of short-term male prisoners release from uh, Peter Burroughs jail in the UK. And I think it was a success. You brought down the refunding rate by 9% and you paid out the dividend of 3% to investors. So how does it work? Because it's a right. very new model <laughs> for investors. So, right. So social finance was three years old and I had a team of 18 people working hmm. in the basement of my office in Portland Place and two young people, 30-year-olds, mm -hmm came up to my office one day and said, you know, we've been trying to work out how to innovate in reducing the rate, as you were saying, of uh, at which prisoners go back to jail, which is over 60% across yep. the world. What do you think, they asked, if we link a reduction in the number going back to jail to a financial return? I said to them, you found the key to the capital markets for social entrepreneurs. We've all assumed that we can't measure anything in the social area, <laughs> but we can measure a percentage reduction. Absolutely. may not be a measurement of the quality of life of a prisoner, but we can measure uh, a percentage reduction. And we went to the Minister of Justice, whom I happen to know, yep. and we said, look, we will raise five million pounds. We wanted to raise... 12, interestingly, uh, but uh, because of the obligation to pay on the results and yeah. budgets and government budgets, on, we ended up with five million pounds and one jail <laughs> instead of three, which I had, uh, I had wanted. And famously, Jack Straw, the justice minister, after he'd heard that pitch, said to his uh, colleagues, 
I know we shouldn't do anything for the first time, <laughs> but we're going to do this. Okay. <laughs> he was he was brave so, enough. <laughs> yeah. He was brave enough to do it. So yeah. the idea is, if you promise to pay, yeah, you the government or a group of philanthropists or aid organizations, or a combination of all three, promise to pay for social improvement achieved, yeah, then that promise to pay that contract enables you to raise money from investors who then take the delivery risk mm. on. It means that the government doesn't have to put the money up, but very importantly, like venture capital, it gives fantastic focus to the leader of the organization trying to reduce the Absolutely. recidivism uh, yeah. rate. It leads to the generation of great data so that you can do a better job at doing it. It means you're managing the process and improving the process of rehabilitating these prisoners. So whereas previously there were some organizations working with the prisoner in the prison, some yeah. working with the prisoner at the gate, some working with the prisoner trying to get into a job, some working with the prisoner trying to reconnect with their families and society, all of a sudden you had one focus, to get the prisoner to avoid going back to jail, yeah. to yeah. get into a job. And, and all of a sudden the system changes. And in fact, the results coming from social impact bonds are 10 times the amount expended hmm. in terms of economic Return. value, social, yeah, yeah. socio-economic value, 10 times. We sit across several wow. countries. That's how it works. No, that's a super exciting story and very specific example because sometimes people talk about social innovation. They talk about, of course, social impact measurement that you know well. There's a lot of books on that. But I think having a having created a real world system as well, both for social entrepreneurs, but also for the society and the investors to actually give back, but in a responsible way, in a, in, in a way that matters and that scale financially makes a lot of sense. Uh, just building on that, of course, because we picked and you picked that issue, but there are so many other issues, of course, in not just in UK in the world to go after. I was speaking uh, a few months back, uh, Ronnie, to a social entrepreneur and philanthropist, Akhtar Bacha, who's a friend of mine, uh, and podcast. And he said something that really struck with me. He said, don't try just to build organizations, build a movement, <laughs> a movement. And, and as I as I love meeting with a lot of social entrepreneurs in my life as well, I'm supporting a community of entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs in my home country in France, as I share with you. Um, I, I'm certainly very, very sensitive to that kind of movement uh, concept. So is this something yeah. that you've been consciously trying to achieve from the very beginning in a way? So beyond the prisoner reinfunding, reinfunding rate, <laughs> what is what is yep. the the movement you were to create and and sustain and you aspire to see even bigger now, Ronnie? That's a great question, John Philippe. The answer is yes. We were trying to create a movement, but the ideology of the movement, the ideas supporting it, evolved. Hmm. And again, it's a question of luck. In two thousand and twelve. Because of the success of Bridges Ventures, which was the first yep. impact venture capital firm, which I co-founded in 2002, because of the success of social finance, because of the success of social impact bonds, the Cameron government hmm. asked me to chair a G8 task force on social impact investment. And this was a seminal effort, and the report we wrote is a seminal report, and interestingly, it's titled The Invisible Heart hmm. of Markets, yeah. uh, as opposed to Adam Smith's Invisible Hand of Markets. Hmm. What we saw was that what the social impact was doing, which was we could then express as optimizing risk, return, and impact, was happening in the world. Hmm. You could look at 13 trillion of environmental, social, and governance money. Today, it's over 40 trillions, nine years later. Yeah. You could define a field of impact investment 
where you have the intention to create impact, but you also measure the impact created. Hmm. And so the notion then shifted from saying we've invented a new instrument that can help charitable organizations or businesses seeking to achieve social or environmental improvement to fund themselves mm. in very imaginative ways. And by the way, the idea has caught on in financial markets now. Mm. And there's one and a half trillion, trillion, <laughs> not billion, trillion, trillion. dollars, Jean-Philippe, of yeah. sustainability-linked bonds and loans inspired by the social impact bond. But that idea of pay for success was mm. only part of the story. Yeah. The question then arose, if the world is moving to risk, return, and impact, yeah. which is the way to tackle our social and environmental issues, mm -hmm. what's required for this shift of system? And the answer was simple, mm. impact measurement. Yes. And so the idea shifted from funding the non-profit sector and businesses trying to do good to changing our economic system and moving to impact economies. Yeah. And we're well on our way to achieving them now. I'd like to go back to that, uh, actually, Ronnie. It's a great uh, development, obviously, of, uh, of history, of capitalism as well. I think you would agree uh, about the fact that capitalism is confronting an unprecedented identity crisis. When you, you look at where we stand against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we are falling behind. Inequality is increasing. Climate change is obviously burning, uh, literally. But it's also a fact that capitalism, and I'm certainly part of the corporate world, so I can relate to that, has proven to be the most formidable engine of prosperity, enabling our societies to level, levels of development that we could not even conceive two centuries ago. So given all the in involvement you had, as you said, at the core of, uh, of government, of uh, actually uh, of uh, the G8 and more, um, how do you see the role of government bring about the change and um and and yeah let's start with that question <laughs> okay so there are, there are several uh questions in the question you ask the first is what is driving capitalism today and the answer is there's a very big change in what's driving capitalism. There's a huge change in values, which started 10 or 15 years ago with young people who refused to buy the products of firms that were creating harm, yep. uh, or to work for those firms. And that became noticed by investors, and they realized that it had implications for the profitability of their companies, and then Yep. Asset managers were also under pressure from their clients. Pension funds were under pressure from their savers to do the right thing with regard to the environment and, 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 and society. And now, as we were saying, you're talking of tens of trillions. You're yep. like half of all professionally managed money is following ESG guidelines, seeking to achieve impact as well as profit. Now, that's a big change. Huge. in terms of Huge capitalism. Yeah. The, the second thing is we're seeing a second leap in technology mm. that is as significant as the invention of the microchip has been. Mm. The invention of the microchip at the time was thought by a lot of people to threaten the computer industry with change. But now we see that retailing is... Yeah is completely transformed by it. Every every single business model in the world has been transformed by technology over the last 40 years. The same is happening again, but this time the technology is coming together with the values I just described to yep. deliver impact at the same time. And Tesla is a good example of it because Tesla didn't go out to just optimize risk and return. It no. went out to optimize risk, return, and impact. I may not have done so perfectly, 
because we don't measure all its impact, maybe it's a net harm uh, uh, full uh, company rather than a positive company bringing solutions. Uh, but you have to recognize that a key to its success was the impact dimension. Hmm. Consumers who wanted to buy their products, talent who wanted to work for them, investors who wanted to invest in companies that were doing good, doing well. And 156 million of venture capital in 2000 has turned into a, a trillion. And the third force, which is a major, major change mm. that goes with the change in values and the leaps in technology, is that the technology enables us to measure the impacts of companies in ways we have never been able to do. In the last half a dozen years, big data and computing and machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence have enabled us to calculate the monetary value of the impacts that companies create from their operations mm. on the environment, uh, from their products uh, on uh, uh, people in the environment, from their supply chains on people in the environment, and from their employment on, on, on people. And so the effort at Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative at Harvard Business School, which I'm privileged to chair, mm -hmm. has published data sets of more than of, of more than 15,000 companies today mm. showing some of their impact in monetary terms. And if you look at what's happening in the world, and I don't want to anticipate your future mm. question, but I may <laughs> as well make the point while I'm on yeah. it. You see the SEC putting yeah. on the table now mandatory disclosure of every environmental impact that's yep. material by companies. You see... IFRSF, the foundation responsible yep. for financial accounting across the world, setting up the International Sustainability Standards Board under the brilliant leadership of Emmanuel Faber, the former CEO yep. 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 of Danone. Danone. You yep. see, yeah, you see the EU so, passing legislation on transparency of investment vehicles, which affects every asset management organization yep. that wants to sell in in the EU. So we're now in the transition to impact economies that optimize risk, return, and impact. So we see all of that happening, Ronnie. I'm with you. There's a lot of momentum again. Uh, and as you said, I mean, it's pretty mind blowing. I think Bloomberg said the ESG assets could exceed $50 trillion by 2025 one third of the total projected assets in the world and our management globally, it's just huge. So those numbers that you said reflect uh, acutely the awareness and more than awareness, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the drive to take some actions among investors, shareholders, etc. But the problem, as you rightly said, is measurement. <laughs> it's something we'll talk a lot about at Microsoft as well, and we're trying to help with our data, digital cloud platform capabilities. So my question is really, how can we select, pick, and measure impact funds that can really make a difference? Uh, <laughs> given your, your depths of experience, that's a question first. As a, as a pure investor, how would you do that? And then we can go beyond that to talk about the standards that are not necessarily all there <laughs> underlying those data. Right. Yeah. So f for an investor to be able to measure their impact, they have to be able to measure the impact of the companies they invest in. Yeah. We've shown at uh, the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative at Harvard Business School that you can create frameworks, which we have published. We've published more than 23 reports over the last three years that show how you measure the different categories of, of impact. You can measure environmental impact. You can see that ExxonMobil creates $39 billion of uh, pollution from its operations a year. Mm. You can compare it with Shell at 23 and with BP at 13. And you can see within the fossil fuel areas that some companies are better performers from point of view of impact yep. and others are, are laggards. And, and the money is going to the better performers. We see already a correlation, not necessarily mm. uh, in the fossil fuel uh, 
industry, I don't remember, but across many sectors, you see a correlation between higher pollution and uh, lower stock market valuation. You can do the same for employment, mm. Jean-Philippe. Yes. I think this is a mind, mind-blowing mind step forward. For sure. You can look at the issue of diversity in a company's employment. Yep. You can compare the demographics inside and outside its facilities. You can put an average salary on the missing numbers of people yep. from gender groups or ethnic groups. You can measure advancement and you can measure mm. differences in pay. And you can come to the conclusion that Amazon has uh, a, a six and a half billion dollar diversity debit a year <laughs> versus Apple of 2.5. Hmm. And if you relate it to wage bill, Amazon's actually the better performer with 16% of the wage bill in diversity debit versus Apple's 24%. And you can do the same with product impact. You can measure the sugar content um, yep. uh, harm that is created by Danone and say it's $8 billion a year against EBITDA of $5 billion a year. You can look at General Mills Fiber and say the net health impact is t plus $2 billion. And you can see apps in France, by the way, yep. like Yako, <laughs> used by more than 20 million yep. people to... So yeah, already I'm with you, and uh, obviously uh, there's already uh, tons of work happening uh, throughout uh, many, many situations as well. But the key to me is how do you how do you establish global standards? You know, uh, how do you create that accounting integrity when it comes to ESG? And you know that super well because you've been so close of the GAP system emerging in in the older days. What is the new GAP system? that globally could well, become relevant for all business so that there's one version of the truth <laughs> that can be really analyzed well, the same way. Are we going to get there, you think? What is needed to go there? We're definitely, we're, we're definitely getting there, and we're going to get there within the next three to five years. Hmm. Why? Because the data around impacts is stock price sensitive, as we've been saying. And the more data abounds, the less verified data, the less comparable data there is, the bigger the problem for regulators who want to maintain orderly markets. Yep. That's why you see standardization coming in now through the SEC and the ISSB. Now, it's coming on quantity yep. metrics, tons of carbon liters of water, yep. but the effort of the IWAI at Harvard and now the new International Foundation for Valuing Impact will be to standardize uh, the valuation uh, coefficients mm. to go with these metrics and then you will have generally accepted impact principles. Now, if we have a minute, Jean-Philippe, yep. I just want to say humanity has already been there. Mm. After the crash of 29, yeah. Investors sat up and realized they had been investing in companies without understanding what profits they made. Every company could pick its own accounting policies, yeah. and there were no auditors to verify the numbers. It took four years <laughs> to get to the mandatory uh, use of gap accounting and the use of auditors. Two years after COVID-19, we already have efforts to standardize the impact metrics of quantities yeah and we are advancing on the valuation front hmm. so what's happening is that we have found a way now to bring impacts into financial analysis and the valuation of companies and it's going to have to become mandatory because that information needs to be made available to every investor, and that's the role of regulators. Well, I'm glad to hear, uh, Ray, that you are optimistic about uh, that urgency to happen in terms of standards, measurement, accounting, which because I think it's going to be foundational to making that investment uh, thesis you have real across the world and, and get the corporate world to suddenly you know, take his part to the, to, to the challenges. Now, I'd like to, to finish a couple of questions and, and shift gears a little bit, uh, Ronnie, to talk about leadership. And, you know, um, 
uh, in your case, you've been an entrepreneur, you've been an investor, a CEO, a chairman, government advisor, philanthropist, author, and many other things. <laughs> so in all those capacities, you've been able to make an impact by bringing the best of finance to serve the social good in the world. As you reflect on your unique strengths and talents, what would be your advice to a young person, not necessarily a refugee, but let's say just a, a young person, a young female male, uh, on how to be the change they want to see in the world? What should they do? They should bring impact to their core values. Hmm. If you want to work for a company, work for a company that's delivering positive impact. If you want to be an entrepreneur, create a business model that has impact at its core. The more sales and profits you create, the more impact you deliver. If you want to work for uh, a, a non-profit organization, measure the outcomes that you create. Use these new tools of impact investment to supplement traditional grant giving. And if you want to uh, be an investor, mm. then realize that optimizing risk, return, and impact is the best way to deliver superior returns today, superior returns. Mm. Uh, that's the new game. How to use impact to drive superior returns and get your portfolio to align with the creation of impact. You don't need uh, to invest in companies that do harm. In fact, today, you see very few ventures being created that have as their aim mm. to make a ton of money while polluting the atmosphere. But, you know, values have changed. And if you want to work for government, then get yourself into the impact unit of the government. Here in France, where you're based and from which I'm, yep. I happen to be speaking today, there's an impact unit in the Ministry of, of Finance with eight people in it. Get yourself into that <laughs> unit and drive this revolution forward. Well, thanks so much for your coaching for many of our listeners, uh, Ronnie, and, and for, for youth in the world in a way they can actually drive impact in their lives. As, as we said all along this uh, podcast, I think you, you remain an incredible optimist. You, you, you refer to this forum, I think, where you talked the future of capitalism that you had in the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, where you said there are three major forces around uh, acting in the world to improve it today. Environmental and social values, technology innovation, and impact measurement. Uh, so I believe, like you, does, that the th those three forces can be for good, actually, if they are well combined together. But it seems to me that we also need something else. We need a new leadership model a new leadership mindset. We need leaders who are purpose-led, who can drive positive energy in everything they do, and who are striving to change the world for good. So what will it take to bring about this new generation of what I'm calling positive leaders who, are who can nurture the common good? What do we need and how it's going to happen? <laughs> So we asked the same questions when technology came, right, Jean-Philippe? Yeah. Uh, how, are we, how are we gonna get a new generation of managers who understand technology? The answer is entrepreneurship and a huge venture capital and private equity sector now, $10 trillion worth. I, when I started out, <laughs> my first fund in Europe 1981, 10 million wow. pounds. Wow. Latest Apex fund, 14 or 15 billion, right? The venture capital industry is a very powerful engine. $25 billion went into venture investing yeah. last year related to climate alone, alone yeah. right? So this combination of entrepreneurship and available capital is what is going to drive this disruption. And those that don't embrace impact thinking are going to be left behind like IBM was left behind <laughs> by Microsoft and Apple and, you know, and, and, and others. So this is a mega trend. Mm. And if you're young today, in the same way that I felt something was in the air yeah. when I was 26 and the technology and entrepreneurship 
was going to be a huge thing globally. It wasn't just going to be in the United States, as some people thought it might be. Then similarly today, sense what's in the air today. Mm. Sense that we cannot solve our social and environmental problems without a change in our system. It's our system, stupid. <laughs> it's our economic system, stupid, right? We, and to change our economic system, we have to drive capitalism to optimize not just risk and return, but risk, return, and impact. And we have to get companies to bring solutions, not to create problems. So as a young person today, you're the ones, or as a young person, you are the one <laughs> who is going to be leading this revolution. That's a wonderful way to almost conclude. But before concluding this uh, conversation, uh, Ronnie, I'd like to finish with a nod of spirituality. <laughs> One of my favorite books is the, the Second Mountain by David Brooks. Don't know if you've read it. Uh, maybe not, but it'd be a pleasure of your copy. That's of interest. So just to share his vision for our listeners. The first mountain, uh, he said, is the individualist worldview, which puts the desires of the ego at the center. The second mountain is what you might call the relationalist worldview, which puts relationship commitment and the desires of the heart and soul at the center. Eventually, most people realize that the central joy of modern life is to move from being all about me to being at the service of others. <laughs> so David Brooks calls it the good life, and he wrote, Relation, relational life is a challenging life, but ultimately it is a joyful life because it is enmeshed in affection and crowned with moral joy. So, Ronnie, you're obviously well on your way to the top of your second mountain. Have you reached what David Brooks call moral joy and you feel that deep sense of joy inside yourself every single day of your life. I'm a great admirer of David Brooks and, and I read his <laughs> articles. I would love to read his book. I have said something similar in, in, in my books. I have said fulfillment comes from a balance between what you do for yourself and what you do for others. And I find fulfillment in the last 20 years, which has been 80% to improving the lives of others and, 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 and the environment and trying to resolve the Israeli or help resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I have found more fulfillment in that than in anything else in, in my career. And it isn't our duty to solve everything. It's our duty to start the process of solving everything. And so I totally agree with David, with David Brooks. Mm. And I think the millennial generation is on his wavelength. Fantastic, uh, Sir Ronald Cohen. Again, it was, it was really a delight uh, to have this conversation with you and to feel not only this invisible heart of capitalism, but actually to feel a vibrant heart of a new capitalism and uh, new leadership as well. So thank you so much for being part of that podcast. It was really a, a privilege. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Philippe. Thank you for all you do. Mm -hmm.